Stories stir the soul. Stories reveal. And stories heal. In this podcast, we will give you an inside look at someone who's had a life-changing breakthrough. Real people, real stories with real breakthroughs. As a health and wellness expert and coach and Todd as a men's mentor, we've seen firsthand what God can do when it comes to a breakthrough. So lean in, listen well, this could be your biggest breakthrough. Hello and welcome to this episode of Your Biggest Breakthrough. I'm Wendy Pett. I'm Todd Isberter. We are so delighted to be here with you today. This podcast is part of the Spark Media Network and it can now be found on the Edify app, Pray.com and KHCB uh, streaming and more. So we hope you are finding your favorite place to listen to this podcast and share it often. You know, there isn't just, there's not a person I know that hasn't dealt with some level of grief, right? Yeah, because all of us experience loss, Yeah, right? And yeah. Uh, But the loss of a loved one is probably the hardest thing to get through. Mm. And uh, this is what we love about today's guest. We're going to tell you about her in just a moment here. But I, I'm just going to start out with one of her quotes because I think this is so profound powerful. and so applicable. Mm-hmm. And uh, she says, the more you invest now to heal your broken heart and come to a place of acceptance and peace, the better you will withstand the future storms of life. And mm. there is so much truth in that statement, but how you get there is a whole other thing, and that's what our guest is going to share with us today. Yes, Candy McVicker. She is an author. She's an inspirational speaker, and she is devoted uh, and a devoted advocate for families who are grieving a baby or child. After experiencing the stillbirth of her daughter, Grace, she founded and became executive director of Missing Grace Foundation, whose mission is to provide support, resources, and education for families and professional care providers when there is a loss of a baby, infertility, or adoption challenges. Candy has been featured guest on Fox News, Focus on the Family, and Building Relationships with Dr. Gary Chapman. And she lives in South Carolina with her husband and her two daughters. So we are thrilled to have her on. She is passionate. I've known her personally because uh, I have emceed a couple of her Um, her events to help do fundraising for her Missing Grace Foundation, and I'm just honored to know her. So welcome to the show, Candy McVicker. Come on in, Candy. Yeah, so good you could take time today with us. And, um, yeah, your story is incredible. I'm good. (laughs) So good to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking time. You're you're actually out on the road right now, and so thank you for making time in your schedule for us. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. I'm here in Minnesota for Missing Grace. I know, I know. Yeah, right. So I, uh, I have been honored and privileged to to be an MC at these events, the Hope and Heart um, uh, Run walks, and um, you do those every year, and it's just so impactful to to see these families come around to support one another because they have this common. Uh, ground and understanding of, of what grief really is and, and they they just come in a beautiful way as a community but when I see the release of of the balloons for for their their missing loved one it is I mean I cry every time every time candy yeah people walk up to me and hug me that I you know I helped 20 years ago I mean it's a family we we become family you know um we didn't in, intend to meet this way but this is the way we met and um, they'll just hug on me with tears and smiles and say, this is one of my favorite days of the year. And wow. that, that always really has touched me like, wow, Christmas, birthdays, da, da, da. But they're like, this is a day my grief is validated and my baby's life is validated. Their significance is not ignored. And people come around me and say, yeah, we choose to remember. Mm. So that's actually coming up here this week. It's this Sunday. So really excited. Cool. And that's why I'm here in town to put that on. Well, there's so many people who can relate to losing a loved one. And you are actually a, a, a grief and trauma specialist. So I'm guessing you're in pretty big demand from people who want to know, help, how do I get through this whole thing? So let's go back to the but beginning. you know personally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you, but let's go back to the beginning of where this all started with you. Why don't you share with us the story of um, what what happened years ago when you lost your little baby? Well, I was um, married just a, a brief while. We really wanted to have a big family, so we we didn't wait a whole long time to start. 
and I'd had some friends have miscarriages. So I, I remember thinking, oh, I pray it does that doesn't happen. But I know I know I'd get through if, if it did, but I just pray that doesn't happen. And we were very blessed to get pregnant right away. Um, but the pregnancy itself was really, really challenging. So I had something called hyperemesis or I was sick all the time. And um, I just didn't feel very good. And I dropped a ton of weight, um, not the weight plan, loss plan you want to have. And, um, and, you know, at the, at the, at the end of the pregnancy, I started to notice decreased fetal movement and it just was very noticeable. I just had flutters and not a lot. And so I would go into the clinic and I would say, you know, I don't feel the baby move. Do you, do you mind doing an ultrasound? But all six visits, they said, ultrasound is not necessary. We just will do a Doppler check and listen for the fetal tones. And after a while, they would hear the heartbeat and they would say that was satisfactory and they were fine with what they heard. But on a seventh visit, um, I think probably they weren't hearing the heartbeat, um, but I didn't know because I could hear my heartbeat. And anyway, they sent me for the ultrasound and that was the dreaded day where they said there is no heartbeat and it is dead. Mm. And I I didn't even register like... Um, I didn't understand it didn't compute and and as um as i went through that whole process you know i had to go to the hospital go through 24 hours of labor deliver a perfect healthy beautiful baby nothing wrong with her but she needed to be delivered by cesarean section because she had what's called a velamentous cord which was seen on her 20-week ultrasound but they they never told me about it, it says it in her file but um it's a very high risk cord issue there's actually four thousand babies that die of that particular cord issue in the United States every year, mm-hmm. and um, which is actually more than SIDS losses. So it's it's wow. pretty significant. And um, this cord issue means the umbilical cord attaches the outside of the placenta. And so she just needed an early delivery. It just means their connection to lifeline is slowly not working very well. Mm-hmm. And so um, after losing her, we just... Um, we, we went into a dark place. It was really hard. I had nobody else in my life to talk to about it. Nobody else had been through this. And when I reached out to people and organizations, I didn't get the, the response. I thought a lot of people were cold or very short, or they were dismissive of my grief. And that's kind of all part of the story of how God used this. Yeah. Well, real quick, Candy, what, what stage in the pregnancy was, um, did you, did they discover that there was no heartbeat? What, yeah, what stage so is this? The 20 week ultrasound is where they diagnosed that cord issue, but the, um, the, the birth, I, I gave birth at just a day shy of 33 weeks, eight and a half months. Of okay. Wow. So, um, you know, for, she, she was fully formed, beautiful. And, you know, we held her, we have pictures with her, but back then it was just a disposable camera. So we only have a few good pictures um, where now we, we um, encourage people to take as many pictures on their phones as possible. But I, I when have you say back then, um, when she was, was this born 20 December years ago? 20th. Yeah, December 20th, 2001. 2001. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. So to go through a, a full pregnancy and then to deliver uh, stillborn, um, I can't imagine the emotions that you and your husband uh we're going through. I mean, did this affect your faith at all? Yeah, you know, initially we were very congruent in our just coming together and praying and seeking the Lord and just crying out to him. But then it just felt really quiet from him and really dark and really lonely and the reality of she's not coming back. We don't get to keep her. Everybody else's life is moving on with all their babies. Cause eight of my girlfriends, including my sister-in-laws were all, we were all pregnant and due within three months of each other. Oh wow! My, my bridesmaids and all my besties and, and they all went out and had their, their beautiful children, which I'm so happy they did. Cause I love their kids. It just at the time was really like, oh my gosh, I don't get to be part of that. You know, all the celebrations, all the birthdays, there was a reminder. Mine is not here. So that, that created this, you know, hard place in my heart where I just was like, God, why us, you know, and it's the question we all ask and we don't get answers for that. Um, 
uh, you know, I, I do ultimately feel there's the thief who's out to kill, still and destroy. And God gets the rap a lot of times for all the bad stuff in the world. And I, I do feel like he says it, it wasn't me, you know, <laughs> I didn't do that to you, but I, I agree with you. I weave with you and I'm here for you. And I, I, I'm giving you my comforter by my spirit. Um, but I, I had to wrestle it out. And in the wrestling is this beauty because you come to the end of yourself and the end of your, you know, entitlement and expectations and, and this, this thought process that you deserve something different than everybody else in the world. And, and I, I, I realized I'm so not alone. The hardships are plentiful amongst humans uh, of, of, of the, the grief experience. And we all grieve many different things, but, you know, many of us are grieving a baby. Um, one in four women lose a baby, you know, and that's a husband and wife or boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever that is, but one in four pregnancies ends in a loss. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty significant. And it's not that you just say, well, so what that just happens, but I look at that as there's a lot of people out there that are hurting and they're grieving and they're thinking they're alone. And, you know, they don't, they don't realize um, there's a lot of us out there that would love to support them and help them. And so in that journey, part of the, the, the bridge that brought me into a better place um, into my land of promise with the Lord um, it, it was really about um, helping others and realizing that God could use this, this tragic, horrible situation for good. And can, can I just I, pause, I just want to, I just want to put a pause on that because that, that is so relatable uh, because I've heard from others who lost a loved one, uh, whether it's a tragic circumstance or however they lost that person, they feel so alone initially, like, okay, everybody else is moving on with life. And my life is completely torn to pieces. And there's, there's, uh, how do you avoid the tendency to become so self-focused and begin to feel so bad for yourself that you overlook what others might be going through? Because you just said, really, that one of the ways that you got out of it was you started to reach out to others. H how do you make that transition when you're, you're steeped in, dark in place. pain yeah. and you feel mm -hmm. nobody understands what I'm going through? Well, overall, grief is kind of selfish. It's a very internal thing. Normally, we lick our own wounds. We, you know, we're don't get out of bed. We can't hurt, you know, get to work. You don't want to even shower. You, you're just, you know, you're in a dark place. You're depressed. You, you, there's many ways that we try to heal the hurt in us, you know, whether people do it constructively and they're out there working out like crazy or working overworking because they're, they're really trying to fill something that only God can fill. They're really trying to replace this pain with something else, whether it's constructive or not. And, um, you know, we get a choice, we get the opportunity to look around us and look outside of us. And, and it is about choices. I mean, every day we get a choice, take every thought captive unto Christ, right? I can take this thought and become very destructive with my thought process and perseverate on things that are not going to create good fruit in my life and that are going to be damaging. Or I can say, all right, you know, this is my circumstances. I can't change it. What can I do? And if we look to the word and if we pray, God will always guide us to something that's beautiful. Yes. Always. I mean, he always, he's so faithful that way and always, but that I just see him constantly say, if you'll hold my hand, if you'll listen to me, I will guide you to something really beautiful. And there is recompense in, um, in the kingdom of God. Okay. So I really believe God is, he, he does ultimately take note of everything he sees what has been to his done to his children and what the enemy meant for evil. God says, yeah, but I'm not finished yet. And I have the final word on this. And not only do they have that baby for eternity, that that child is is part of me. We co-created together and 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 that baby, they get to have that for for always. You don't ever get to steal their baby from them because my my two babies in heaven, they're there waiting for me. I actually had another loss, too. and. And so um, that's in, in, in the, you know, all of eternity, but here in the now, 
I see all the time God is working things for my good. And he is showing me that's recompense. That is an area where I'm not going to let the enemy get any territory or ground or, or, or cause you hurt in that place. Again, I'm guarding you. I'm protecting you. And, and I'm giving you extra. Like you get more. You get more favor. You get more blessings because you did suffer. And in the suffering, you still turn to me. And, you know, when we go through trials, we can say, heck with you, God you didn't do what I wanted. I'm done with you. And we get the chance to do that. You so know, Candy, someone listening right now may, may really be saying, yeah, that's way to go. Candy. Good for you. But they right. are so angry and bitter that they don't even know that they can even take that first step to even receive God's truth and his, and his word and in the light that it deserves to be taken in. And so what would you say to that person to get through to that next level so that they can bust out of that anger and bitterness and resentment, right? So that they can have a fresh new uh, view of what really God is doing in and through them, through this grieving process. Well, the, the, the mind is, is very, you know, it's the place where uh, we have to have our helmet of salvation. If you aren't saved, it's going to be a lot harder because yeah. those of us who've come to faith in Jesus, like we have, a different access to the ability to get the breakthrough. Yeah, so yeah. first I would just say, invite Jesus into your life and Amen. receive him as your savior, because he is the only way he is the way, the truth and the life. And so all of the good benefits of what could come to you out of this hardship will come to you through Jesus. Now, if you say, look, I haven't done that yet. I'm not there. I don't know that I can take that step right now. Um, you know, it, if you believe in a higher power and you believe in God, right? And you believe that there is a, a some kind of creator in this world, start talking to him and wrestle it out with him. You know, um, I think about the thief on the cross next to Jesus. And he said, today, you'll see my father in heaven. That guy did not live a very virtuous life. He did not do all the things right. He didn't go to church and read his Bible and do everything. But his heart and posture towards God was, I see you're the real deal. And I believe in you. I actually wish I would have known you earlier, but I, I'm knowing you now. And, and so right. I just would say, know him in the now, try to find him. And then I believe in the wrestle and, and in the anger, it's okay. He can handle everything. Tell him all the junk, get it all out, journal it, go to a counselor and tell him about it. Go to your pastor and do, you know, ministry with them to, to just say, I, I need to tell you all this. I'm pissed. I'm angry, whatever, you know, we, oh, oh my gosh, you know, God can handle it. He, he can handle the anger and the pain. And then yeah. ultimately when you, you know, and you get it all out now he can fill you up. And, and so I think sometimes you just have to get rid of all the junk and, and also, you know, who are the people in your life? If, if you have people in your life and you think they have a life I want, they have something good. What do they have that I don't have? Well, what is it about their character? What is it about their walk that's different than what you're doing? If, if you have friends who've gone through hardship, how did they get through it? So I, I read books like crazy. I read all these books about people went through way worse tragedies than me. Oh, they lost 12 kids. What? Oh my gosh. They went through, you know, a tsunami and everything went, went away and they were the only one holding onto a tree and everything, they watched everything go and they lost. I was like, how did, how did they survive? I wanted to know how does a person survive the most horrific things? And so that was one of the ways I did it. I was like, I want to figure out what was in their character, what was in their mind, what was in their faith that got them through the most darkest days. You know, Candy, you are, your words offer such hope and your words actually also offer promise. Uh, and that's because you're a very credible source, not only because of what you've been through, but as you've helped others walk through theirs. And we, just, we love the fact that you're basically saying, get after God, go find him. He'll answer you. Do the work. And it, yeah, it, well, right. You've just got to make certain that you are willing to let it out and to have it out with God if you need to, because God will show up and you're tremendous proof of that. I, I have to ask you, I just want to go back a couple of notches here because when you, when you lost your baby, especially after that 20 week ultrasound and things but, were suspect, but it wasn't even known. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was just identified in even the file. So yeah. when I got my file, I looked back and there could have been a different course of action. Outcome. Well, how did you handle that? Because this is true for so many people that they see something that, oh man, what if I would have, and then there's some regret that sets in. Did that, 
did that affect you in that way as well? Well, this is a really cool part of my story too. Um, so when I got that information and I went to the doctors in the hospital and said, this could have been different and this didn't have to be this outcome. This was here and you guys didn't take the course of action needed to save her life. Now, obviously they were terrified. This could be a lawsuit. Oh my goodness. And that was not ever my intention. I really wanted to make sure no one else went through what I went through. Mm. I was on a mission to save lives. And I just couldn't fathom that if, if somebody else had to just keep going through this over and over because they kept making that same mistake. So in my mind, I was thinking, what can I do to change this system, to augment it, to improve it, to have a better standard of care? So I went after education. And so I, I wrote to this hospital. I had to do a lot of work. It was not easy, but I was able to bring in a specialist who um, helps study stillbirth and he's on our board of directors and, he, and he's, he's really an excellent teacher. And he, um, he actually came into the hospital and taught all the doctors and nurses there about how to prevent this issue, how to identify it and record issues on ultrasound and how to manage the pregnancy to have a positive outcome. Now in that meeting, so I have all these doctors and nurses that in, have failed me in a way, right? Like they've, they've, I, cause I saw six different doctors during those six visits. There are six different people who could have intervened and they all didn't. Well, one of the doctors came up to me sobbing and, and this is, could be incriminating. Like he, I could see the other people going, oh no, don't show her that emotion. Don't, don't tell her how you're feeling. And I'm going to tell you what a beautiful path to healing this is, is to own your junk. Okay. To, to say when you feel bad about something, to apologize. There's such beauty in a true apology. And he came up to me and he said, I am so sorry that I failed you. And that my choices affected your daughter and her life. Wow. And I want to change what I'm going to do here. And I, I want, I want, I want to improve and I've learned a lot. And so will you please forgive me? Wow. And, wow. and it was so authentic and all these other people were standing around going, oh my gosh. And I said, that means the world to me. That yeah. means so much to me. And I know in this moment, you're going to save lives because you're going to take this experience and you're going to change how you manage your care and your pregnancies for your other patients. And I absolutely 100% forgive you. Wow. And in that moment, there was such freedom. Yeah, yeah wow. such freedom in that, in that being raw and authentic. And, and Candy, I just have to say immediately, way to go for digging in and doing the work and taking your pain into a place where you, 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 you made it your mission to make sure this doesn't be a painful place for somebody else, because that's what it takes in this world is to, is to step up and rise up in a place where, and in, in, in a time where it doesn't feel comfortable and it is hard work, but it can change the trajectory of people's lives, uh, because you step up in that space and that's what you did. Mm -hmm. So, um, my next question is, is okay. So this isn't something that you went through alone. You and your husband dealt with this together, but we haven't talked about him and how he handled this because men and women are wired differently. And I'm really curious as far as like a marriage is concerned, how did y'all handle this and how did he handle the grief and, and what took place there? Well, um, he was very supportive and still is today. Um, he held me, cried with me, prayed over me, um, you know, did everything he could. There was such congruency, especially in the initial stages. But then he had to keep the boat afloat. So he's got to go back to work. He's got to pay the bills and he's got to, you know, keep things going. And so I perceived that as, wow, you just moved on. Like you just, whoop, up, oh, I'm back to life. Like, did that yeah. 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 And, and, and I was not understanding that. I was mm. like, well, I want to talk about her and I miss her every day. And I feel like I could nurse her still. I mean, like I, I'm very confused about how you're dealing with it so differently so there started to be some resentment and then also you know I wasn't my same bubbly happy-go-lucky self so he lost this like you know I'm I, I was a jokester and fun and life of the party kind of person and all of a sudden I was depressed and down and frumpy and you know and so he was like worried he's lost his wife like oh my gosh where is this woman that I married like a, a whole part of the package of who I am was wasn't there you know like it wow. was had faded into the background and 
And so we started to rub each other raw. We actually started to be short with each other. And there was not a lot of grace in our responses to each other. And we were argumentative. And it was like, oh my gosh, so this best friend of mine, and we have this great marriage. And we would tell every, you know, like we love each other. We love doing life together, but grief rubs raw all of the buffer. Like anytime you go through some major hardship, you can be doing great until you have a financial struggle. You can be doing great until you have a physical struggle and you can be doing great until there's grief. And all of a sudden, all of that, you know, ability to just shrug it off and water off a duck's back, you it's gone. The buffer is gone and you're raw. And it's like, if you could imagine open, you know, raw nerve ending. So in that process, what happened is I reached out and said, I need help guys. Like I want my marriage to thrive. I can tell that it's in a difficult place. And, um, all these people wrote back to me from my online support group and said, you guys should try the five love languages. That book has been super helpful for us. And maybe that will help you. I didn't know anything about it at that time. And so I read through the book really quickly, did all the, you know, tests and then had him do his love language tests. And we laughed. I remember sitting at the table laughing, like we are totally different love languages. <laughs> I have totally been trying to love you the way I want you to love me. Exactly. And you can love me the way you want me to love you. And yeah. it's not filling our tank. And it's, it was like, it would be like talking Chinese and telling somebody how much you love them in Chinese. And the person stares at you has no idea yeah. what you did. That's so And so that was the big game changer for us. Wow. It totally radically started to change our marriage. And it's still something we use all the time. Thank and we're you, aware of Dr. Gary awesome. Chapman. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, <laughs> so who would have thought of that? Right. I mean, I think that's, that was who it was brilliant on the part of the person or persons who started to suggest that. Uh, and then I understand that led to a book. Then did you co-author it with uh, with Dr. Chapman? Yes, uh, uh, my husband and I were at a marriage conference because we we always take time to invest in our marriage. Huge, so, right um, there. Yep, Someone yep, listening. Big, yep. big time. And so, um, you know, I, I know a lot of my friends who say I can't, I can't. Uh, the kids are little, I can't. But I'm, I, you know, I'm like. I'm not a good mom to these kids if I'm not got a strong marriage. So we we got our sister, his sister to watch the kiddos went on this week long uh, trip um, to the Bahamas to love song marriage conference, which whoop, whoop, I love them. If you, <laughs> you put it in blood. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, Dr. Chapman was there and the Lord just divinely brought us together. And um, he said, you know, we need to write a book about this because what I shared with him is you know, I began to implement that in all my support groups. So I run grief support groups and they're very active. And there was a sweet spot of time where everybody who came were couples. Sometimes it's just women, but there was a whole long period where I had couples all coming together. And I just said, you know, I would like to, I'm going to give you this book and I want you to take the quiz and I would like you to just report back and you're, I'm going to give you little assignments throughout the, the coming um, um, months of our group together. And I want you to just see how does this augment things? How are, how is, how is communication going now that you're shifting how you love each other? Um, and, you know, we would get the, we would giggle here. We're at a grief support group, but people couldn't wait to come and share their stories and how, different they were communicating now and how much better their marriages were getting and how they were getting through grief um in a whole different way and it was putting the oil back and the buffer back and 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 the marriage was thriving now other people i will tell you that you know 80 percent of marriages supposedly fail within a few years after the baby dies wow. it's a very high statistic but in our support groups we never see that statistic Wow. I mean, it's, it's very rare that we have our families tell us that they've gone through a divorce. Um, most people, when they apply this, what we're teaching out of our book, it actually works and people can improve their marriage. That is a awesome practical therapy because you said earlier in the interview that sometimes grieving can be almost like a selfish uh, experience, right? A process. And then if you can turn outward to somebody else who's in need, it begins to help heal you and also refocus things. I think what you're talking about, like with the love languages, th it's almost be like a fun shift because now you're not so focused on the grieving process as much as you are on your mate. And how and do I just, love them You've better. just discovered, oh, I've been loving her him the wrong way. And right. when you've got that, uh, that added motivation to find out how can I love her 
the way she really needs to be loved. I would think that helps accelerate the grieving process and not to mention that just really strengthens the marriage. So kudos to you for, for latching on to that and helping couples go through that. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, speaking of all the couples that you deal with and, and they are all grieving on different levels, what would you say? Um, I mean, I think people may judge other people's grief if I could be so bold. How's that problematic, right? Yeah. Well, um, People rate, we talk about that in the book, uh, about a grief meter, um, sort of like um, if you imagine a, a police officer uh, points a gun at the car to get the speed, he doesn't know who's in the car, he doesn't know if you're speeding to get to the hospital to yeah. get an emergency, he just, he just taken a speed of, dom- you know, a reading, and yeah. a lot of people look at us and do a reading, okay, and they just, they, they surmise that this is, this is what I'm going to allow for, um, uh, just understanding and patience with your grief process. So if you had an early miscarriage, my margin for you to grieve is very short. Get over it. It's like it. a judgment, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I think that this is not a big deal. And therefore, since I think it's not a big deal, you you should only grieve briefly or not at all. Because it, and, 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 and so even in a support group example, you know, one person who had, um, a later loss, they would say, well, you, you just had a miscarriage. I lost baby full term. And then in the reverse, somebody who had a miscarriage say, well, I only had a miscarriage. I can't imagine what you went through. And in that process, they just diminished the, the right of their own to grieve and, and basically said, my, my baby wasn't important, but that's not true at all. You know, all these babies matter. Uh, they all are significant. They're all in eternal, you know, soul. And, we, we just, um, we need to be better at just looking at each other and saying, you have all the room to grieve the way you need to grieve. As long as you're not hurting yourself or others, I have no judgment on your grief and I'll just love you, you know, love yes. God, love others. That's, that's the, the primary thing of our lives just, and, and so if we love them, that, what does that look like? And if you do know someone's love languages, you can love them even better because we will receive that message better. For example, with one of the love languages is words of affirmation. And that's a top one of my husband's. He needs to hear verbally, written wise, in text, in email, whatever. But I appreciate you. I love you. I'm thankful for you. Good job. You know, and that you could, you, if you never said any of those words to me, I'd be fine. I don't need to hear any of them, but could you please help me get this stuff done? Like I have things that need to be done. That's his. (laughs) I'm a doer. And so if I'm going to love you, I'm going to serve you. I am going to, what can I do? Do you need me to clean the house? Do you need me to run errands? How can I help you? And so, you know, he'd come home. Oh, you're so beautiful. I love you so much. And I'd be like, yeah, you're like, thanks, but take out the trash. <laughs> That's too funny. I, I just, I'm always like, ah, blah, 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 you know, and he's like, gosh, and I did not have enough tenderness in my words and I did not have enough sensitivity. And he just was like, Oh, my heart, you know? And, um, I was like, Oh, words really matter. And I really have to think about how I say things. And cause I felt like it was, you know, if you meant it, you just put your actions behind it. Right. And you showed people your love. <laughs> Hello. We're the opposite. It's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, usually you are. Usually you are opposite. So I mean, these things are comical, right? Because you realize in there, where's my error? Where's my, you know, pride or my selfishness? Or, you know, we can't have the world all be about me. We have to be about you, you know, and and put external focus. So now I I think about it. I'm like, he just did all this wonderful stuff. And normally I would have just he wouldn't have got any accolade for that. He just would have been like, okay, you know, but now I'm like, honey, that meant a lot to me. I mean, and I'm not making it up. I'm not just giving lip service. I've learned through this process. My words are life to him. My words actually soothe his heart, comfort him. They, they bring him joy. He, you know, he, he can get tears in his eyes when I'm saying, when he comes to you, I really mean what I'm saying. You know, um, he sends me notes every morning. He always writes to me all these sweet things. Aww. And now I take time and I treasure that. I, I'm like, oh, thank you. That's, you know, he, but he serves me a lot. Like he, he knows a clean house and errands run and things done. Well, that might have some beautiful rewards later on. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> that is too funny. Uh, you know, there's, there's another payoff besides when you love the person the 
way they want to be loved, the fact that they're being loved and being appreciated. There's another payoff is that I really feel good doing it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen overnight, I'm sure, but the more I practice the ways in which you want to be loved, the easier it becomes for me to feel really good about myself. So there's like kind of like you can't, it's a no-lose situation, right? Exactly. Uh, That's so good. Candy, you've, you've got so many profound things that you've shared, and I want to encourage people about your book, Holding On to Love, because it's a very practical guide, really. And but very those that have lost a, a, a baby or a child. Yeah. Yep, yep. How to handle grief. How to handle grief. Uh, but on top of that, you've got this organization, Missing Grace Foundation. And uh, tell us a little bit about how that got started and, and what are some of the resources available. Yeah, what do you, what do, you do with Missing Grace Foundation? Because you guys do a lot. Well, Grace is our firstborn. And then we created the acronym Grace, Grieve, Restore, Arise, Commemorate, and Educate. So that's our goal through all of this. It's pregnancy and infant loss support, as well as support for those who are going through, through infertility or adoption challenges. And we're going to help them through their grief. We're going to help them restore in their emotional, relational, physical, and spiritual health. We're going to help them arise out of the dark place, arise out of the ashes. Um, there's beauty for ashes in our stories. And we're, we're really trying to help people find that and see what that could be and help guide them towards that. And um, we believe commemoration is really critical. Um, if we just try to skip over it and ignore it, I find it's, it's actually more damaging and people don't actually fully heal well. But if they can find an outlet and a way to honor their loved ones, and that could be through volunteering, it could be through donating, it could be through um, you know, all kinds of things, create a beautiful garden, do something to improve your community, but you do it you know, thinking this is in oh, memory yeah. of that loved one. And then educate. We have to learn from these situations. Sometimes there's mistakes and we could do something better. Sometimes it's just life, but we're learning lessons because of the life lessons of what we've gone through. But education is really important. And, and that is a big part of sharing the story. So I'm encouraging every one of our families, learn how to give the elevator speech, but also learn how to write it. Go write a book, go write poems, go you know, become somebody who blogs or shares in a way where you can share your story because your story is impactful. And by the word of our testimony, we break the power of the enemy. So um, that's what we do. But Missing Grace began with support groups. Then I grew to have conferences. I really uh, wanted to educate and bring um, both the healthcare professionals together and the care professionals, whether you're a funeral home director, a nurse, a midwife, a counselor, but anybody who might be working with people going through grief and bereavement. Um, I wanted to connect them with families so they could hear from them and they could hear from each other and not be enemies or frustrated with each other that they could say, how can we work together and, and understand? And, um, and then, you know, we, we just grew, we had developed a center, a place to actually go and be where we have a library and a gift shop and a call center. We get emails and calls from all over the world. Um, I developed the Grace Care Package, and this these are baskets and totes filled with beautiful items. We have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers all over the world who send us. All of a sudden, we'll just get a box. We have a whole thing on our website of what you can make and how to make it, what the dimensions are. But we hand make ba baby blankets, baby outfits. People donate wedding gowns, and we make baby um, outfits and gowns from those. We make candles. We make baby bracelets with a baby uh, little heart charm with baby feet. Um, we have books and literature and <clears throat> um, bath bombs and lip balms. That this whole care package goes to this family and it walks them through every question they're going to have, all the different things they're going to be able to do if they want to, and it's all guided and it walks them through everything. So those are in hospitals all over. We, we, we grow that all the time into different new places. And then um, I do a lot of speaking and teaching. I love to teach hospital staff and care professionals and um, and work with them hands on. And so that's that's what Missing Grace is. And um, it's a family. I love it. I love what we get to do. Well, what an awesome work. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, what's the website? <laughs> Missing Grace Foundation. Missinggrace.org. 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 We'll put yeah. that in the show notes. Also, the title of your book and how to uh, get a hold of that and how to get a hold of you. CandyMcVicker.com. And I'll put that in the yes. show notes yeah, as well. That in there as well. Yeah. Uh, the, all the things that you've been sharing, if I could just summarize just kind of in my own simple brain, um, going through this process, can uh, the, the way that you're describing, gives absolute, almost guaranteed healing 
especially if we will start with our relationship with God and bring him into the center of it and walk through it then with others. But it brings healing, which then leads to freedom, Mm -hmm. which then leads to contribution to others because it almost seems like it's a natural outflow. Once I've gone through this and I'm healed and I feel free, I now have a desire to want to help others in their time of need. And you are a perfect model of that. So thank you for sharing what you have today with our audience. Thank you, Candy. You are making a huge impact and difference in the world. And I'm honored to be your friend, honored to know you. And thank you for all you're doing with Missing Grace and all you're doing on the speaking uh, circuit and with this book with Dr. Gary Chapman. So we will put everything in the show notes, but thank you for sharing your heart. We just adore you. Oh, I appreciate it. It was a joy and it was just really special to be here with you guys. And I pray that this reaches many people and it's helpful to you and, and that you will reach out and we'd love to journey with you. I love it. I love Thank it. You. Bless you, Candy. Take care. Thanks for being on your biggest breakthrough. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Take care. Wow. I just love Candy. She is the real deal, and um, she gets it. She gets it, and she well, has, she gets it because she's been through. She's it. been through it, and she has helped so many people because of what she's been through. But the fact yeah. that she has risen up out of mm. her pain, but risen up and made the difference. I think so often we may come out of our pain, but we don't do anything about it. Mm in order to make a difference for somebody yeah. else so they don't have to go through that pain. I think yeah. that's a big difference. And not that everyone's called to that, but, 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 but man. You're, you're so right. They're, they're, I don't believe that God, when we, when we bring him into the center of it, will allow any of our tears to be wasted. Mm. I mean, he, he truly understands, and it does take time, and we do grieve differently. Yes, but the do. beauty of what, uh, what Candy is sharing is that there is absolutely hope on the other side, and you might not see it right now. Um, you might not even want it right now. But in time, it will yeah. happen, and there's hope on the other side. Yeah, and the power of community with that healing yeah. as well. So yeah. make sure you step out, reach uh, to Candy, and, and reach to, uh, you know, look at her organization and see how they could help you as well. But we appreciate you, mm-hmm. and uh, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Your Biggest Breakthrough. We hope you're encouraged and that there is hope delivered in this message. So uh, blessings, and we'll catch you next time right here on Your Biggest Breakthrough. Head on over to yourbiggestbreakthrough.com where you'll find some free resources and information and a place where you can comment and we would love to dialogue with you there. So thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.